I want to thank you both for showing up here and, and to talk about these issues. And Jeff, uh, Citizens Utility Board, in, in brief, what's that about? So the uh, Citizens Utility Board, or CUB, uh, in short, represents residential ratepayers. Uh, we are the the folks that go in and, and make sure that um, uh, you know the ratepayers like you and me are well represented at the Public Utility Commission, where uh, rates are set, where different utility policy is set, uh, and in front of the legislature, uh, and in you know in other forums where our interests are at stake. Um, and we like to, to say that, you know, most uh, ratepayer groups across the country, you know, really just look at rates and, you know, if rates are going up, that's a bad thing. And, and obviously you need to keep rates under control, especially in these economic times. People are having trouble paying their bills. But at the same time, you know, being Oregonians, we're interested in more than just rates. We're interested in where our power comes from. We're interested in... Uh, sort of the long-term impacts of our power choices today. And so we like to say we not only protect people's pop pocketbooks, but we also protect their values. And so we're looking at um, where does energy come from? What investments are being made? Um, for instance, we have, uh, have an active transition from coal project where we're saying, you know, coal is not a good long-term investment. Um, you, we need to be investing in cleaner resources and a cleaner energy mix um, that services us, you know, long into the future. And so rather than certainly building new coal plants, but even investing in existing coal plants is not a, a good value for customers. Or coal trains. <laughs> or coal, you know, or coal trains. And so yeah. it's a little bit more of an indirect uh, piece. So, uh, you know, we, and so we cover electricity issues, natural gas issues, and uh, telecommunications issues as well. And if people are interested, uh, then go to our website, which is OregonCub.org. Right. We've, had, we've got that up under your name when, you, when uh, your name is put up there. So, well, that was really succinct and to the point. And uh, we'll just start off with, with Mark. Um, what is Oregon, which you mentioned, what we got to do, we got to make things more sustainable. Your organization, that's what it's doing, right? We're trying to figure out a way to make them more sustainable. And the way I got involved in this was... Uh, I had been a student in college in Germany years and years ago, and I got a chance to go to the World Cup in Germany in 2006. So I landed in Munich, and I couldn't believe it. Everywhere there were solar panels. There were solar panels on residential roofs. They were on apartment complexes. They were in fields. They were on farmers' barn roofs. And I thought, what schools? Are, and schools. Yeah. The industry. I thought, what are they doing in Germany that we're not doing in Oregon? And I decided to try to make it my business to find out. And what they've done in Germany is they used a feed-in tariff. And what that means is the utilities are required to purchase electricity from small producers at prices that enable them to earn a return on their investment. That they don't use? Well, that they, they feed the electricity back into the grid. That's oh, how they get the okay. name feed-in feed tariff. In tariff. Yeah. It doesn't translate very well, but that's what it means. And in Germany, one of their slogans was, you have a piggy bank on your roof. And so what this did was enabled small homeowners, small businessmen, to, to make money generating clean, renewable energy and sending it back onto the grid. I have here a graph. I don't know if your, your camera can see it. I'll, I'll try to put that, that up for him here. That, that shows how the uh, ownership of solar photovoltaic systems in Germany is distributed. And you can see there that 39% of it is individuals. That's 20, in the red there. 21% of it is farmers. And then the rest is spread between industry and developers and so forth. But only 3% of the German solar electricity is generated by the utilities. So it's, it's a democratization of the grid, if you will. We don't have to have monopolies anymore. Mm -hmm. And one of the advantages of having this distributed generation, which is what you call decentralized. it, when you have it mm -hmm. decentralized, is you're not reliant on long distance transmission lines where you have power losses and you have the expense of transmission. You have the environmental impact controversies of siting these transmission lines. So what Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy is trying to achieve in Oregon is something like they've achieved in Germany and elsewhere where we have distributed generation of renewables. It's not just solar, by the way. A lot of it is wind. It's biogas. It's geothermal. So all of these things enable us to contribute a diverse mix of clean energy to the grid. Mm -hmm. That's what we're after. That all makes real sense, and that's very succinct. 
the weather. Doesn't that the weather cut into the that's a great, solar panels? That's a, a that's a great question. Every place in Oregon has better solar access than any place in Germany. Really? And Germany has become the world leader in solar uh -huh. electricity with almost half of the installed capacity in the world. And it's not just Germany. It's these feed-in tariffs have been used to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy now in 60 countries around the world. So we're a little bit behind in the United States, but we think in Oregon, uh, with our tradition of Tom McCall and solving problems and being leaders, that we can become leaders nationally in Oregon. And you're working to do that in, in Salem, I understand. We are indeed, yes. All right. Well, uh, just recently, Jeff, as a, as a uh, member or a staff person for the Citizens Utility Board, you went to Germany mm -hmm. and you were there with Jules Bailey, I believe, a oh, senator yeah. or a representative. representative from Salem. And uh, that's what really got this whole thing going, is I heard that you were on a, a, a telephone conference call or something, I believe, with... Uh, uh, with uh, Oregon Renewables, and uh, that's when I heard that you went there. And then what did you discover when you went there? Yeah, well, first, you know, I should give credit where credit is due. I mean, um, uh, and Mark can talk about how they had the opportunity, but they had the opportunity, along with many other groups across the country, to nominate folks to be picked to go on the study tour. Uh, and it was a climate and energy study tour. Uh, in early December of last year, uh, December 2011. No, great weather in Germany uh, in December. Yeah, that's right. It was pretty much like it was here. Oh, okay. Um, kind of, kind of uh, wet, kind of cold, especially in, in Berlin, which is primarily where we were. Um, and so uh, they asked if they, they could nominate me. I said, sure. Um, and then, to, you know, to my surprise, I was, I was picked as one of the ones. I said, uh, you know, because this was a na nationwide nomination process. Oh, really? And, okay. So, um, so there were 16 of us from all across the country, and Jules uh, and I, Representative Jules Bailey and I, were actually two Oregonians. Wow. We were um, sort of the only state that, uh, aside from the D.C. area, there were a couple of people from, from D.C., but we were sort of the only two um, folks that were from a, the same state. This was just like fact-finding, right? Yeah, and so it was, um, uh, it was uh, the trip was sponsored by the American Council on Germany, and their... Uh, their mission is to really kind of create, you know, better understanding between, you know, the U.S. and Germany in particular, but also, um, also throughout Europe, and to have, you know, to make sure that, especially these days, a lot of focus is on Asia, you know, China, India, um, Japan, very important, but they you know, their case is there's still a lot of, you know, economic cooperation and a lot of, you um, uh, you know, a lot of benefit to having continued relationships with, with Europe. Um, and so they sponsored it and, you know, we, uh, you know, I landed um, probably mid-afternoon on uh, a Sunday. You know, we literally had our first, uh, you know, talk that evening um, oh, during grueling. dinner. <laughs> and uh, we were pretty much expected to be at the, you know, in the lobby of the hotel where we were staying. Every morning at 8:30, we'd go out. We'd hit a couple of, uh, have a couple of speakers. You know, we'd pile into a bus, go to a place, have a presentation for an hour or so. We had another place for an hour or so. Go to lunch. There is always a, at least one speaker and maybe two during lunch. During the afternoon, there was a couple of speakers, Ooh. and at dinner, you know, there was a pre-dinner speaker, and then usually one, two, or three dinner <laughs> speakers dur during dinner, and you know, you'd get back to the. Um, uh, hotel around 10 or 10:30, and just be you know your head would be just you know yeah. pounding. Right. Um, so there wasn't a lot of downtime. Uh, definitely wasn't sort of a, a tourist. Um, no time to digest. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I was doing a lot of digesting. And so what you heard about was the conference call that OREP sponsored to have uh, uh, Jules and I kind of report back um, to folks. And, you know, what I learned, you know, just a couple of, of key highlights, and we can kind of go into, to, you know, deeper detail, is that, one, you know, there is a much more coherent, cohesive, and consensus uh, or, um, position around climate. I mean, you know, there is no doubt, you know, uh, on any level in pretty much any political party, wherever you are in the political spectrum, you know, they say climate change is real, and we need to deal with it, and we need to to put in place serious policies to deal with it. We need and to get so, ahead of it. Yeah. 
And so they do have, um, you know, a, uh, a carbon trading system, and that uh, generates uh, a, fair amount of, a fair amount of money that they put into energy efficiency and other clean energy um, technology. Um, second, they have, you know, a very long-term vision. Um, they are setting policies now that, uh, you know, to, you know, have achievements and to have reduced carbon emissions and that sort of thing by 2080. You know, they're very long-term, uh, very long-term thinkers. You know, not just the, you know, to the next election, but, you know, to the next several elections, next dozen elections. Um, <coughs> and then one person that we met with um, made a very interesting comment because uh, one of, he was asked, um, well, you know, what if there's a change in government? You know, is you know, are is there going to be a shift in policy? Where is that going to go? And his, you know, his response was, there might be some nuances, some changes, um, and some tweaks, but we're very confident that the general you know direction that we're on um, is going to stay the same, no matter which party is in power, or as they put it, no matter which color is in power. You know, all of their political parties are designated by a color. By a color. Oh. Um, and so those were some, you know, very, um, a lot of messages that we were, uh, that we were hearing a lot. And then we were really there at a key point during the whole Euro crisis, um, which is continuing oh, yeah. uh, to this day. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the German Chancellor, uh, Angela Merkel, is, you know, deeply involved in, in uh sort of trying to fashion a way through that and there's a lot of concern about you know what you know that um, you know financial crisis for the entire eurozone really means for long-term energy policy and long-term energy planning um, there's you know concern now that their carbon trading revenues are significantly below where they're projected to be nobody's panicking about, uh, panicking about that yet but they they did um, you know, it was a source of concern and something we heard about um, mm -hmm. at several stops along the way. And then, you know, we got to meet with, uh, you know, several policy experts that could get way down in the weeds on, you know, feed-in tariff and, you know, a lot of the, the uh, you know, policies that we were hearing a lot about. And, and so we can go into some of those weeds um, later. Sure. Well, so the feed-in uh, tariff, which is one of uh, many components yep. of what you were learning about. Yeah, definitely. No, no that's overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> all this stuff. Uh, uh, you can keep it all straight. <laughs> yeah, right, right. No, that's right. Do, do you, the two of you are the, both doing the same thing or? Uh, kind of, kind of, sort of from different um, from different aspects. I, okay. You know, we're very plugged in on you know the entire range of, of energy issues and and climate issues and and carbon right. issues. You know, from the perspective of the consumer. And so what what we okay. ask, you know, we you know we definitely ask how can we do it, but then we ask very much, you know, how much does it cost and how do you balance the two? And that's what. We, we do work together on a lot of issues, but some of the differences are that one of the things that OREP does is to look beyond just the pure energy part and just the pure climate part and look at the economic and job creation okay. part of this. All right. And one of the reasons that we have encouraged the feed-in tariff in Oregon is that we hope we can replicate the dramatic increase in employment that they have had uh, in Germany. Um, they have created about, uh, I think I have a graph here, something on the order of 300,000 jobs in green energy in Germany. Because we know that burning coal is a bad deal for us, not yeah. just environmentally. But in Oregon, we send about $6 billion a year out of the state for energy. And if you think about it, Oregon has no coal. So we what have is this? Right. We got this up there. What is this, what is this thing saying here? That's the development of jobs in renewable energy in Germany, uh, starting out in, I think, 1998 and going up to the present. And we, they've created almost 300,000 jobs in Germany in the renewable energy sector. Mm -hmm. And each one of those jobs is a job that is not devoted towards burning fossil fuels. And as I was mentioning, we send all this money out of the state in Oregon okay. each year for fossil fuels. But if we were to put people to work 
in Oregon generating that clean energy locally, there's a multiplier effect. Instead of that $6 billion going out of the state to out-of-state workers and out-of-state corporations and out-of-state stockholders, it's being used for Oregon manufactured uh, solar panels, for Oregon roofers to put on new roofs, Rather for Oregon going to China. for Oregon mm -hmm. banks. And those dollars recirculate in our local economy. So it's not just a way of creating clean, clean energy. It's a way of stimulating job creation and lifting up our local economy as well. Which is obviously what Germany did. Which is what Germany did. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and it makes a lot of sense. And I hope I didn't break your train of thought. My arm was going to get tired here. <laughs> and that was an important point, is job creation. And as, and as, as he said, you, that's not something that's on... That's all on you guys. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a good um, uh, byproduct, but uh, right. one thing that we are, are um, very clear about is that, you know, the, the you know, utility ratepayers shouldn't be a, a source of economic development. That's not the, in our view, that's not the, uh, the purpose of the utility system. And, you know, what we've seen in, you know, in the past, and this is um, something that kind of ended more than a decade ago, but we saw pretty frequently is that, you know, you know, utility rates were seen as sort of an economic development driver, and if, if a, um, you know, big manufacturer or a big company was looking to come into a particular community, uh, that community would kind of work with the utility company and say, oh, can we kind of offer them sort of lower rates? And they say, oh, yeah, we could probably do that. Well, that has to come somewhere. I mean, the, the cost of the service doesn't come down. And what we were finding that, well, mostly that was coming back to residential customers. And it's like, well, wait a second. You know, what's you know what's really the purpose of the of the utility system? Should we um, be operating safe, reliable, and uh, as and ever increasingly cleaner power, and have making sure that everybody kind of carries their share of the cost, or is it an economic development driver? And so I like to think of it as you know you know, as individuals, it's really all coming from us, but it's um, coming out of what I think of different pockets of the same pair of pants. I have, you know, part of um, what I'm doing in making these investments are, are as a rate payer, and it's coming out of my rate payer um, pocket. And there, you know, I don't care that much about economic development, but I'm also thinking about it in terms of um, a taxpayer. And so as a taxpayer, I'm very concerned about economic development and I want to make sure that um, those um, jobs and manufacturing jobs and that sort of thing either locate here in Oregon or stay here in Oregon. But um, that's you know, either through tax credits or through other sort of things that are decided through public policy at the legislature or whatever and come out of my taxpayer pocket. And then in just the general market, I have a consumer pocket. And so the, the, the products that I buy and the decisions that I make in my everyday purchases, that makes a difference too. And, uh, and so it's kind of like, and as a consumer, a general consumer, I have, you know, different interests than I do as a you know, rate payer, consumer, or as a taxpayer, and mm -hmm. so even though they you know, overlap, so. and they definitely overlap, and so what we kind of tend, to, so what we uh, focus on is what are our interests as a as rate payers, um, and then what we also very much believe is that there are no silver bullets, um, that we need sort of a mix of uh, of solutions, and I think that you know, for instance. Uh, you know, there's there's a, a pilot for um, the feed-in tariff to get 25 megawatts of solar through the feed-in tariff over the course of of the next couple of years. We're a couple of years into the pilot, and there's a couple of years um, more to go. And you know, we were you know we weren't supportive of just kind of saying we'll have a feed-in tariff because what people say is well the, well the utility is required to buy that power. Well, the utility doesn't have any money of its own really. Eh, that's not true. They have shareholder money. But you know what they buy that power with is our money, and so what that is saying is that the utilities are required to charge the ratepayers to do something, and so what we want to make sure is what the ratepayers are required to do is you know is affordable and doesn't you know drive costs up too much, and uh, and so what you know where we look at you know there's probably a role for the feed-in tariff, um, but there's also other approaches like. Um, the solarize Portland, and there's other communities and uh, around the state that have solar that have solarize efforts. <coughs> Excuse me, and they uh, that is sort of a mixture of neighborhoods going out and saying, 
to different uh, installers, solar installers, we can guarantee you 200 jobs, uh, installation jobs in our neighborhood. Give us uh, a request, you know, we do a request for proposal and tell us the cost, you know, um, for installation, knowing that you, you know, we can guarantee 200 jobs. Like, oh, well, if I know I'm getting guaranteed 200 jobs, I can sort of bulk order a bunch of panels rather than buying them, you know, for one job at a time. Right. And then they can pass those savings along um, to the customer. And so you see a combination of um, uh, tax credits. You see a combination of utility you know, uh, ratepayer incentives, and you see a, um, a discount from the market, from uh, from the installers, and then, you know, the ratepayer just out of, con out of their consumer pocket pays a little bit into it, too. I know, you know, I have solar panels on my house. I know Mark does, too. Mark oh, went through right. the, um, Mark went through the, the feed-in tariff. I looked at the feed-in tariff. It's like, that's not that's not for me. I, I sort of want to, you know, you have to sort of commit over a 15 year period of payments and that sort of thing. I sort of wanted to get it taken care of up front and take advantage of the tax credits and ratepayer incentives and the, the discount. And my, my payoff with all of that together is um, going to be, you know, in about eight or nine years rather than 15 or 16 years. And so that worked for me. Feed-in tariffs could work for other people. We need to have a mix of um, uh, a mix of approaches to how we deploy solar, wind, geothermal, etc., throughout the system, so that um, energy stays affordable for all consumers. Mm -hmm. And so I, a I, lot of ways we could go from wow. there. And, and I'll just let you. And take I think off, I think we need uh, all of these things a mix, right. as Jeff has talked about. We've learned a lot about too big to fail. When Enron had too much power in the electricity industry, it was not a good thing. When the banks on Wall Street were too big to fail, it was not a good thing. There are lessons here from biodiversity and there are lessons here from baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, in baseball, people like to talk about the guy that hits 60 home runs a year, hits a grand slam home run. But the team with that guy on it rarely wins the World Series. You've got to have fielding and pitching and base running and bunting and singles. <laughs> And I and I think that and in fans in, in, and fans and coaches <laughs> right. and in in in, 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 in yeah. biodiversity we realize that we have a richer more resilient environment when we have lots of different species that are healthy when they're not all going extinct I think it's the same way in energy there's not a silver bullet there's not a home run out there we need solar we need wind we need biogas we need hydro we need all of these different approaches so that we have a diverse mix of renewable sources that is not going to come crashing down at once if something changes in the environment or in the economy um, probably people have noticed that their electricity rates aren't going down our rates are going to continue to go up but we have some choices to make about how our rates go up and I've given uh, Jim a, a chart there that shows the mix of our uh, uh, electricity sources in in Oregon about three percent of that is from wind 34 percent of it on that is is coal 14 percent is natural gas do we want our rates to go up to pay for coal or do we want our rates to go up to pay for renewables to pay for local jobs in Oregon these are important policy choices that we need to make and we want to look beyond not just the, the electricity rate but we want to look at the impacts on our communities we want to look the impact at the impacts on our planet one of the things that I think Jeff and I do agree about is the need for increased energy efficiency whether it's in industrial processes or whether it's insulation and caulk in your home because insulation is by or excuse me energy efficiency is by far the cheapest way mm -hmm. for us to make progress in the energy field and if our electricity rates go up a little bit but we have greater efficiency and we're using less electricity our monthly bill doesn't necessarily have to go up so you look at the situation of a residential tenant why does that residential tenant want to feed in tariff it might cause his or her rates to increase why is that a good thing for her well maybe the air is cleaner to breathe but that's hard to think about when you're trying to make that bill every month. But if the residential landlord could have a tax credit for making that apartment unit more energy efficient so that, sh so that it took less energy to heat it, less energy to light it, then 
that slight increase in electrical rates for renewables wouldn't cost that residential tenant anymore. And that would be a helpful thing. Right, and the tenant can also make efforts to conserve as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And Jeff mentioned the, the, the what happens in Germany if the government changes, if, if there's a change in policy. And this has been a problem throughout the renewable history in the United States. People uh, in the solar industry call it the solar coaster because <laughs> if there's a subsidy, well put. <laughs> installations go up. Government changes. They cut the subsidies. Installations plummet. New governmental policy. New subsidies. Installations rise. We need to have stable funding for renewables. The economy's bad. Tax credits aren't so attractive. The economy's good. Tax credits are attractive. One of the things that's appealing about a feed-in tariff, it's, it's a production-based incentive. You're just paying for the kilowatt hours that are actually produced, and it's reliable. If I don't do a good job building my, assist, my, my system, the ratepayers pay me nothing because I'm not producing any electricity. But if I'm a developer and I'm thinking about putting in a renewable energy system, a solar array, I need to know that I'm going to have a predictable stream of income over the years before I invest my money. And the other thing about the feed-in tariff or any production-based incentive is unlike a tax credit, it can be used by low-income people. It can be used by nonprofits. It can be used by governmental agencies. Not everybody has a tax liability, and if you don't have a tax liability, then the tax credits aren't a way for you to finance your system. Mm -hmm. I see. I wonder if, uh, going back, I wonder if I could go back to sure. Munich. Munich. And who paid to install all this stuff, and who paid for the panels? The, the small business or the apartment owner or the homeowner typically borrows money. Okay. Puts that, buys the system, puts it on his or her roof, and then each month they get a check from the utility for the power that they've generated, okay. and they have to make a loan payment on that loan that they've taken out to put the system on so, their roof. So they paid to have it installed, and they bought it both. I mean, th these are kind of, think, kind of important things because I think they affect what day-to-day -day, right here in Oregon we're thinking. How much will it cost me to buy the panels? How much will it cost me to install it? And that's why I was asking. What's the interest rate going to be on my loan? How much okay. are my monthly well, payments going right. to be? Those okay. are all things that matter. All right. In my particular case, I wanted to put a solar array on my roof, which was almost 20 years old. And you need to have at least 10 years of life on your roof before oh. you put a solar system on. Oh, okay. So I needed to put a new roof on my house yeah, yeah. before I put the solar system on. So I stimulated the roofing economy oh, mm -hmm. and the solar economy in this state by Mark, doing Mark's that. Mark's stimulus package. Yeah. <laughs> so borrow, borrow so money. we don't need to go to Salem in order to have a feed-in tariff because you already ha you, you can already do it. We, we do need to go to Salem. But because you can't do it without... Without I'm, a law. I, we do have a small pilot program for a feed-in tariff, oh, and that's, that's right. the that's program that I use. Right. But yeah. it's, it's a very small program. We've been learning a lot about it. It doesn't work perfectly. And one of the things that we've discovered is that a lot of people who apply for the program aren't able to install the system because they can't get financing. It's the same problem people have if they're trying to buy houses now. Yes. But but you, you realize that uh, we need... We need low interest loans for these things. I mean, when you see people who are investing their money for a, a half a percent for a, 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 a certificate of deposit, if we could lend that money out to people at low rates to put mm -hmm. systems on their roofs, that would make those systems cost less. It would make the impact on rate payers less because one of your big costs mm -hmm. is the interest. So we have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. to get this straightened out. But really, it's a very secure loan because the source of repayment is coming from the utility. And the utilities are probably going to be here next year and mm. 10 years from now mm. and 30 years from sure. now. So it's a very safe loan, but the banks have not quite figured well, that it's out. It's an yet. improvement on the house. Right? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay, right. right. That's you know, I'm wondering, is, we've had some people on different shows uh, talking about a state bank. Would that help it, any? It would be an enormous help. And I have talked to the people at the utilities. The utilities, with their uh, very stable business models and lots of resources, have the ability to borrow money at very low rates and to lend it out for these systems if they wanted to. But maybe they don't want to introduce too much competition in uh, electrical generation in the state. It's, it's, yeah. So well, there's also utilities don't necessarily want to want to want to be banks. Get in the banking know, and, business. And that sort of yeah. Thing. 
So I mean, a few things that I learned uh, uh, on my trip. I mean, again, we got to talk to some folks that could go way down in the in the weeds. Um, but a couple of, of interesting things, just to give people some comparison. I, right now, currently, the um, uh, the uh, feed-in tariff in Germany costs you know individual ratepayers about uh, 3.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and that is about 14 or 15 percent of the overall rate, um, and their rates um, are much higher than they are here in the Northwest. Um, so, you know, that means that their um, their overall rate is about 25 cents a kilowatt hour, as compared to about 10 here. So, you know, just to and then theirs is also an, a nationwide program, and so they're a, a, a country of about 80, 85 um, million folks. Um, that means there's probably around, you know, 50 million households or so. And so if you take, you know, three and a half cents, you know, a kilowatt hour nationwide um, uh, across, you know, 50 million households, you get a fair chunk of, you, you get a fair chunk of money. And then, and this is one thing I learned that I hadn't known, they put it into sort of a national pot that is then sort of distributed throughout the country. So because there's different, you know, renewable resources in different parts different of the country, parts, so, sort yeah. of like we have here in, in the state. Um, and so, uh, sort of hearing, and they're pretty, you know, clear that, you know, 3.5 cents a kilowatt hour is pretty much as high as they can go without starting to have kind of a, a backlash. Um, and uh, and right now, I think it's about 21 cents uh, a kilowatt hour that, you um, uh, gets paid, you know, from the feed-in tariff pot to ratepayers who install these systems. Um, if you, if we kind of looked at how all that worked here, one is we kind of we don't have the same kind of utility system. Each utility is, is sort of responsible for its own service territory, and so uh, in the the feed-in tariff, you know, we don't, you know, it's kind of each utility is responsible for you know its own its own payments and that sort of thing. There isn't any central pot. Doesn't mean we couldn't do it, but um, that's not currently the way. That's the, the, yeah. not currently the way we're set up to do it. And then you know we are a state of um, you know three and a half, almost four million people. There's um, you know a million and a half or so uh, you know ratepayer households in P in PGE uh, Portland General Electric and Pacific Power Service Territory, which is where the pilot is. And so if we did you know. 14, 15 percent of our rates. We're talking about a penny and a half. So it's it's a much smaller um, sort of pool. And so again, that you know, it doesn't mean that a feed-in tariff can't work, but it's um, probably not quite the the same. You know, it's not operating at the same scale as you yeah. do across you know even if uh, a you know a, a, a mid-sized country like like Germany is. So um, it was really interesting to sort of hear a about some of the details and how it how it runs and then b some of the limitations that i mean most you know in fact i can't think of anybody that says oh no we could probably bump it up another you know quarter cent half cent you know there was a, a pretty broad consensus like we're sort of we're sort of at the top um and also the incentive goes down over time um and so you know the per um kilowatt hour percentage might stay about the same, but the incentive um, is going to be going down over time. So now it's 21 cents a kilowatt hour. In the next few few years, um, it'll probably go down to you know under 20 cents and kind of keep going down um, as the cost of installation also goes down. Yeah, because I was just looking at this mm. where you in Germany the cost of German solar goes down 50 percent in five years. Right. So wouldn't that tend to make feed into making it cheaper? Or uh, maybe ask you, and, I and, I, and I think that's the big question overall, is how do we continue to, you know, just like uh, wind was, you know, a decade uh, ago, 15 years ago, uh, where now it's pretty competitive with traditional fossil resources. Uh, and in many, time, in many times can be the low-cost resource. Solar is not there yet, but the big question is how do you continue to uh, reduce the cost of installation? And we've seen that uh, that cost going down. I mean, just uh, a few years ago, you know, it was nine cents or so a watt to install solar. It's now closer. 
I always get, I, I believe it's um, nine cents a watt, so it'd be nine dollars a kilowatt. So it's um, five cents a watt, five dollars a kilowatt it's now. A big, it's so a big it, drop. It, it is a big drop that that we've seen, and and so it's getting better. And there's and you can pay a little bit more for solar because some some of what Mark. Uh, said, you know, you don't have the distribution charges uh, and costs, you don't have the transmission charges, uh, you don't, it's a peaking resource, you know, in the hot summer day when people's air conditions are on and that sort of thing. If there's a lot of, you know, solar panels on houses, they're helping to sort of help cover that load. Um, there's actually a proceeding right now at the PUC that is trying to figure out you know, what is the resource value of solar? How much can we, you know, what is, you know, let's actually sit down and figure out the economic case of what we can can charge for solar um, and it can be more than for tr from traditional resources uh, how much more is a big question mm -hmm. interesting I'd like to respond to a couple sure. of uh, yeah. uh, comments that uh, Jeff made if you might want to hold this this graph up if the camera can planning. pick that up this is a good one you, you, you see that that the price of solar has been coming down over time now if you imagine that uh, starting down at the bottom of that graph, the, there was a, a different line starting at the lower left for fossil fuels, and that was gradually coming up. Where those two lines crossed, that would be the holy grail. That's grid parity. That means renewables are costing the same as coal. At that point, we stop doing things with coal that harm our environment and harm our health. And one of the, the, the cl very clever things about the German system is that it is designed to reduce the rates over time. Not only in response to the declining costs of solar as installations get cheaper and it scales up, but to force the costs of solar down, to stimulate the decline in rates. So when you hear a discussion in the papers these days about it's costing too much in Germany, they're reducing the rates. That's a success. That's mm -hmm. because they're getting enough market penetration. They don't have to pay that much anymore to get people to put solar on their rooftops. The other thing um, that I wanted to respond to that Jeff said um, uh, uh, was, um, I can't recall. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to be the only one that forgets. <laughs> well, it'll come back to you, though, as well. And, and uh, one thing before we get, because we're down a little over six minutes. All right. Yeah. Now, Jeff, you put something on in your house. Now, is that being fed into the system, or are you mm -hmm. just using that electricity yourself? No, no. It is, so it is um, connected to the system. I'm a net metered customer, and so uh, what that means is um, if I... Um, you know, if I produce more than than my household is consuming, it goes onto the grid and I get a credit for that. If I use less, I'm sort of using the utility as a battery backup, which, you know, these cloudy rainy days, you have to do a lot. But in the summer, you know, you have, you know, uh, I use uh, about between 13 and 15 kilowatt um, hours a day. Uh, in my uh, in my home, which is not too bad. It's um, um, but you know when I see that um, you know I have a little meter on my uh, on my uh, inverter that uh, says oh today we you know produced you know 16.2 kilowatt hours like great I just netted um, <laughs> and uh, so it's a it's a net metered uh, system uh, and then uh, the feed in tariffs are uh, are net metered as well so everything is connected to <coughs> is connected to the grid and you have to have a, a net meter agreement with the uh, with the <coughs> Excuse me, with the utility, but that's these days is pretty standard stuff. You know, one. Well, go ahead. I, I wanted to ask a question before mm -hmm. we lost it here. What happens when you and your people hear this thing from, shall we say, the other side mm -hmm. that says there is no global warming, there is no <laughs> climate change? That's a whole different show. That's yeah, a, yeah, 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 that yeah, different well, show. Yeah do, we, yeah, do we get another hour? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, that, and we, there it's very you know, briefly. Yeah, this is the only country where we have that discussion. That's true. All. It's certainly okay. to the you know to the I mean, we you know, you know, there's a there's to us as we look at it, there's a scientific um, consensus out there. 
um, and you know the data just keeps getting stronger. And you know, sooner or later there is going to be you know regulation of carbon, and we need to just to make sure that the utility system is prepared for that, and ratepayers are protected against mm -hmm. that. The the point that I wanted to uh, make, Jim, right. is that <laughs> it's not all in Germany. The province of Ontario in Canada has a very aggressive program, and there the cost to their ratepayers is about a dollar a month so far. And in Germany, I think the cost to ratepayers, they say, is about the cost of a beer a month, which seems to me to be a reasonable price to pay for getting power that puts people to work and doesn't harm the environment. Mm -hmm. So people, I think one of the things that Jeff noticed in his trip was that there's a different consensus in the population. The people in Germany seem to feel that they're getting value for paying higher rates mm -hmm. for their renewable power. And that's an argument that in the United States we haven't quite accepted, that part of be because of this a dispute about whether global warming really exists. Well, like here locally, you can pay about 10% more in order to get renewables from PGE. So there are a bunch of people that do that. Well, before we get, uh, we, before we lock up here, we're going to get pretty close to the end. It seems to me that the, the larger the array, we put them on schools and places like that, the better it is. It seems like the, the more it, it works as compared to just on top of a person's house. Does, does the scale like that work at all? Well, one of the things that they discover is that if you have uh, installations scattered widely over a grid, you have less impact when a cloud moves over. They've done a, a study on this in Napa, California, where they laid out a grid and, and uh, situated systems on the grid. And if a cloud comes over one array, it's shut off. But if you have these distributed systems, a cloud is very rarely going to cover all of those at once. And they've gone so far as they have to have satellites that are telling them when the clouds are coming and where they're, where they're going to cover so they can, they can turn on their backup power, they can shift yeah, their power interesting, around. Interesting. So wow, in Portland, we have about 12,000 acres of available rooftops. So uh, that's a vast amount of potential and we don't have to use land for it. We don't have to have huge remote arrays. Well, the solar array is not equal on all those. I mean, there's some... Some are shady. Yeah, that's true. You couldn't put it on all 12,000 acres, but if you could put it on 4,000 acres, that would be more replacement power than Boardman, the mm -hmm. coal plant. Right. Oh. Well, this, this has yeah. been really, really incredible here. We're down to about, what, a minute and a half. And we want to also uh, just take a quick second here to encourage folks that are watching now or who are watching this in, in playback time to uh, www.pcmtv.org. Uh, Portland Community Media is up against the budget shortfall this year coming from the city and they need people to, there's a meeting you can go to right there to say that uh, you support public access and how important it is that we have these channels uh, open and that we have the availability of the resources for people to use so that the people out there can the, watch these programs can gather the information good information like we're having right here we have 45 minute discussion of a uh, uh, feed-in tariff and and uh, the Jeff has gone to Germany and, and studied in a brief amount of time and powerful mo moment of time uh, what they're doing over there and th this is something that uh, I think is very important to the viewers out there. Anyway, okay, we want to thank the crew, and we want to thank Izzy's Pizza, and I hope they put up the, uh, the scene on that, and yeah, work the on crew, that. and the fact that it was produced here at Welcome. Portland Community Media. All right, so we got about so it's, got about 30 seconds there, and here's the crew, and okay. we'll get the, uh, the other one up there in a minute. And I want to thank okay. folks for, uh, Mark, and I want to thank Jeff for coming on. I hope That's we, right. uh, I'm sure we could have gone on for a long time, but I think we had a pretty good conversation here. And, and uh, we, we, we didn't beat this to death, but we did talk about it a bit. <laughs> and thanks for, uh, as always, hosting a great show. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right. We'll be back next month, second Wednesday of the month.